For an Englishman, Gary Christian has an all-American story. Working-class kid learns the game of golf from his dad in Britain. Comes to the U.S. to play at a junior college in Alabama. After a mini-tour career that takes him to every backwater in the country, he eventually earns his PGA Tour card for the first time at the age of 40. And in his rookie season, he reaches the FedEx Cup playoffs, where, in the third round of the 2012 Barclays at Bethpage Black, he's paired with Tiger Woods. And wait till you hear that story. Gary Christian is my guest on Media Credentials. I demand satisfaction. My name is Whit Watson, and this is Media Credentials. I'm a sports announcer who's worked a lot of places. This podcast will peel back the layers of sports media and show you how the sausage gets made. Through interviews with industry pros and my own experience, you'll understand why you're seeing what you're seeing and who's responsible for it. Your media credentials have been approved. After a 15-year professional career in golf, Gary Christian's Hollywood story was interrupted by a knee injury, but he found a second act as a golf commentator in the UK and the US, where we have worked together often. Lately, he's been organizing golf trips to the UK, and he's especially passionate about using his story as the basis for a speaking career. One note, we recorded this episode shortly before the PGA Tour announced a partnership with the strategic sports group, so that's not covered. But Gary's thoughts on how the Tour and Live Golf can coexist are still relevant. From his dad cutting down some hickory-shafted clubs when Gary was three years old, to his love of British football and the TV documentary Welcome to Wrexham, Gary and I cover a little bit of everything, including our first meeting 12 years ago. Gary, I feel like this is a full circle moment for me to have you on the podcast. Go back to 2012, the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals Classic, the old Disney event, no longer exists. That was the event that is remembered because Charlie Belgian went to the hospital on Friday night after a panic attack, ends up winning the tournament. But what I remember about it was I was on the ground for that event as a reporter for Golf Channel. You were the first PGA Tour player that I ever spoke to with a Golf Channel microphone on the ground. You were my first interview. Do you remember uh, doing that? I do. Yeah, I'm, I'm honored. Uh, anytime I can be a part of Whit Watson's career, then uh, <laughs> I'm doing something right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get to your backstory, your playing career in a moment. When you were playing, did you ever think about a career in broadcasting? Actually, I did. Yes, it, it was something that had always interested me. Um, you know, obviously growing up uh, listening to uh, BBC commentary. You know, obviously Peter Alice and Alex Hay and and all the greats from the the seventies and eighties. I always enjoyed just how that added to a broadcast and it added to my context of watching the best players in the world. And you know, every now and again, we get Mark McCormack uh, doing the. Um, the open championship and it was just it, it just added so much to it and i thought i thought it was something i could be good at and hopefully i'm semi-decent at it but it, it, it just has always fascinated me how uh, how people's enjoyment can be aided by a good good commentary or good analyst but also be may, maybe perhaps ruined by it as well obviously if you tune into x and look at comments when things are on tv <laughs> you uh, you you see that some people um are favorites and some aren't so uh, hopefully i'm uh, on the earlier on rather than the latter tell me where you grew up and how you discovered golf Pretty humble background. Um, yeah, my dad got me into it very early when I was about three, I think. Just went to, I guess we'd call it a rummage sale over over here. Uh, found some hickory clubs, got a hacksaw, chopped them off to my length. No grip, no, nothing like that. And we were fortunate we had a field at the back of our garden. We went over there and we hit balls. And he, he was an avid golfer, about seven handicap all his life, basically. Yeah, I'd never had a lesson until I was in my mid-20s. But just he... Taught me, uh, you know, good grip, um, stand up to it right. Uh, actually, the stuff he taught me was genius 
without really knowing it. All he had me do was to make the divot after the stick. So he put a stick across on the ball, say, make the divot after that. I did it. Didn't think how to do it. Wasn't told how to do it, but it gave me so many great things that helped for a future in golf. You know, forward shaft lean, flat left wrist at impact, good pivot, steady head, weight transference, everything. And I was never told how to do it. I just did it. You know, it, it was nice to be not overcoached by any stretch of the imagination. And you just let your athleticism do it and figure it out. And um, I kind of had that as the essence of my game throughout um, throughout my career. And, you know, from there, I played all the team sports and, you know, rugby and cricket and football and uh, even a little bit of badminton dabbled with that. And then got back into golf again at about 14. Joined my dad's club when I was about 15. And from there, it was uh, just steady progress. I think I went from a 25 to a 12 my first year, a 12 to a 4 the second year, and then scratched the next year. So I was good, but I wasn't anything spectacular, certainly nothing near national level. But I was frustrated. So when I left high school at 18, I I went straight to work and worked as a pensions administrator, which uh, is actually as boring as it sounds, maybe even more so. But I was playing just at the weekend. So I I was frustrated because I was playing in amateur tournaments, but always felt like I was at a competitive disadvantage because I played twice a week and everyone else played seven days a week. So um, we, my mum and dad and I kind of talked about it and I said, I'd love to try to play seven days a week. We couldn't afford to do it in England. But if I could earn a golf scholarship to America, then there was the possibility that I could at least see where my game would be without that built-in excuse. Uh, Went on a little golf tryout to Orlando, saved up all our money, went there, didn't play great, but got picked by a a junior college, Wallace State uh, in Hansville in Alabama, and played great there for two years. And from there, um, got a, earned a scholarship to Auburn and and played two years at Auburn. So uh, that was how I kind of got to a, a semi-decent level. And um, unfortunately, my senior year at Auburn, was pretty poor went from number one on the team to number five on the team obviously wasn't going to turn pro after that and worked for three more years before i actually turned pro so i didn't turn pro till i was about 28 years old 27 years old um and then sort of hit the ground running which was nice that had to have been a culture shock coming from england to alabama and you still live there today so obviously something clicked let's say let's say it this way i got used to it so um i i I got picked up at the airport by the junior college coach. Uh, you know, I called him Dan straight away, and uh, he said, "Well, now, now in this country, you call me coach." I said, "Okay, coach." We almost got to to, to the town, and he said, "Now, I want to tell you something. This is a dry county." Well, I didn't know what that was. So um, I said, oh, we, we haven't had much rain for a while. Is it going to be firm? And he said, oh, no, 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 no alcohol. Um, so coming from London to a dry county in Alabama at 20 years old was a little bit of a culture shock. But uh, as you say, got used to it, loved my time there, met a lot of good people and, and then stayed stayed there at Auburn afterwards and then basically lived here for ever since then. So almost 30 years now. So many players from Europe come to the U.S. to play college golf. Very common now, but at the time, was it common? Were you a rarity coming from overseas? Yeah, I think it was right at the start when when British and Europeans started coming over. Um, so we, um, uh, Freddie Jacobson went to the junior college. Um, actually, Brett Wetterick went to the junior college. Um, but yeah, it was myself, uh, a, a Scotsman called Ian Steele, who played on the tour as well, a Swede, uh, and there was another Englishman already there. So we, we kind of, we were, I would say that certainly that first generation where a lot of the teams had a number of foreigners on the team. So uh, it was nice in that you had that little comfort level there because you have people that you know, may be a little bit more similar to you. But um, it, it, it was really interesting because it was just, you know, most of us didn't really have the luxuries and that maybe that our American teammates had. So they all had great equipment, great swings. They all had swing coaches and everything. We kind of figured out figured it out ourselves, but we were very hard workers and, and we got the benefits out of that. So uh, it, it was really nice, really enjoyable. You and I are almost exactly the same age. So I think I know the answer to this question. What players did you admire? Who influenced you as a player? Yeah, yeah, obviously Jack Nicholas was was a huge influence. I, I was named after Gary Player, so uh, Gary Player was a huge uh, influence on me. You know, especially being undersized and you know overcame a lot of challenges. You know, certainly with his swing, um, but 
you know, having to travel from South Africa to make his way on the PGA Tour was a, a huge culture shock for him. And, and, you know, he had to do it, though, to, to get where he wanted to in the world of golf. Um, Tom Watson was was a massive um, influence on me and, and Nick Faldo was as well. So uh, Faldo was that, uh, you know, my generation growing up in uh, getting decent at golf in the mid to late 80s was you would watch him and you would watch the dedication, you would watch how hard he worked um, and you would watch, you know, in many ways was almost more like we thought of as an American who, who would sacrifice so much and work so hard and, you know, wouldn't be down the pub with the lads. It was a little different way of, of going about things. And and I think we, we all admired that because it, it was different from, you know, most of maybe the European pros and the British pros in particular that, uh, you know, worked hard when they worked hard. But, uh, you know, after the round, they would be, um, you know, a lot more relaxed and, and going out and having a good time. You turned pro, as you said, at the age of 28, and you won immediately on mini tours. As a matter of fact, your Wikipedia page says over 30. They, <laughs> they, don't, they don't have a, a count of how many wins uh, you had on mini tours. Do you? Do you know how many? What the number is? I think it's right around there. But yeah, now a number number of those were one dayers and two dayers. I, I I just I, basically any mini tour that's ever been around in America, um, in the nineties and, and early two thousands, I played on. So uh, and, and I'll be honest, I I was probably at my happiest playing on the mini tours. I loved it. I loved the challenge. I loved the challenge of knowing the only way you could make money was to win, or the only way you could make money was to finish in the top two or three. So you know by necessity. You couldn't, couldn't play scared of winning, and you couldn't be satisfied with top 10. So um, I, I, I really – the, the tour that I most enjoyed was the Dakotas tour. I would just disappear up to North and South Dakota with a little bit of Minnesota and Iowa sprinkled in and would spend the summer up there seven weeks. I wouldn't come home and would just keep playing, and it would be you know maybe a one day at the start of the week, then no day off, a two day straight after that, then a three day. And so you, it's not like you were sitting on your own in a hotel room with nothing to do. You were always playing. So um, it was nice. They played a load of pro-ams, and what was nice was – you, know, you you would play the first couple of rounds in the bigger tournaments in a pro am format, and next day on the tee they would give you an envelope with money that you didn't know how you did it, but somehow your team did best or top three or something or skins or whatever. So um, anytime on the mini tours you get handed free money that's in an envelope, that's always a good day. You made 174 starts on what is now the Corn Ferry Tour. Back then, I'm assuming it was still the Nationwide Tour. Won twice out there. What was life like once you graduated, if you will, to that tour as opposed to mini tours? I, I think, you know, going back to the wins, it set you up for success in that you knew that when you got in contention that you weren't scared of winning. So it was, it was a step up in class. I actually, when I first turned pro, I got straight through qualifying school after my first year and was on the Nike tour back then and found out very quickly I wasn't good enough to com- compete on what is now the Corn Ferry tour. Um, so I actually spent six more years of frustration playing well on the corn ferry uh, sorry on the mini tours and then missing out second stage of qualifying school every year so uh, we would go back to the mini tours try and get better go back go back forwards and and it was just that frustration level that rose but what i did was i i dedicated myself to the mental side of the game i knew physically I, I couldn't really compete. You know, I'm undersized. I know I'm a lot of swing speed. Didn't have the resources to, you know, spend a load of money in getting better in that respect. But I knew I could get exponentially better mentally. And so that second stint on the mini tours really set me up well for when I did make it onto what was then the nationwide now the corn Ferry tour. And you know, I my first year I, I got a runner up, and so that kind of gave me that belief and. I think I won in 2009, so my third year. Uh, it was actually in a nine-hole playoff, and you know that was just validation that you know number one I had made about three or four footer to get in the playoff. But then you know nine holes, and I hit every fairway, every green. I had what it takes to win, and I beat Matthias Gromberg, who you know obviously was a very very good player who had won several times in Europe. So that gave me the belief as well that boy, I could I could really compete against guys who had achieved a lot, that had been there, that had experienced pressure moments and and I managed to outlast him so that was 
that was the validation. I couldn't quite finish it off to get my tour card that year. I almost got it at um, qualifying school, missed out by one shot, one player. Um, and then, you know, one more year of decent but nothing special. And then finally everything clicked in uh, 2011. That was it. Uh, I, I, I knew I was ready. I won again. I had a load of top tens. My stats were all great and uh, was thoroughly prepared for the PGA Tour, which is what the Corn Ferry Tour does. Obviously, it's different now, a little over 10 years later, because the strength in depth is so amazingly good. So first playing in 1999, you know, there was maybe 20, 30, 40 players who were tour quality. In 2006 to 11, there was probably 100. Now there's every single player on the Corn Ferry Tour could comfortably compete on tour. It's that strong. And all of this leads to your rookie season on the PGA Tour 2012, an unlikely rookie. Tell the story about how you earned your card for the first time. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it, I would say I was probably one of the oldest true rookies who'd never played a PGA Tour event um, in the modern era of the PGA Tour at 40. So obviously I finished uh, ninth on the Corn Ferry Tour, the Nationwide Tour at that time the year before. So I graduated to the tour. And you just really don't know, you know, how you're going to adjust to the, the lifelong dream. I, I thought I was prepared. I thought I was ready to, to play. But until you actually tee off, you really don't understand, you know, what's going to happen because it's it's thoroughly different and it's scary. It's exhilarating. I, I, <laughs> my first few weeks were amazing. Uh, so I, I played on the Corn Ferry Tour and played with uh, Janet Gretzky in Greenville as my amateur in my group, um, we hit it off and, uh, she said, Oh, anytime you're in LA, give us a shout, but you never invite an Englishman to do that because they'll take you up on it. So <laughs> it split my journey up nicely flying to Hawaii for my first event. I, I called them and Gretzky's, uh, Wayne and, and Janet sent a car for me. I spent a couple of days with them, play golf, golf with them at Sherwood and, and then flew to Hawaii, missed the cup, but my first ever hole as a PGA Tour player, birded. It was great. Second ever hole, I lost a ball up a palm tree. So it went from the sublime to the ridiculous. Second week was um, uh, Palm Springs, I believe, and um, finished top 15, shot 64 in the last round and, and thought, you know, I think this is something that I can comfortably play on. It was, uh, it was really exciting to get an early result just to give you that belief. But it was, again, you know, it's just a whirlwind for a rookie, especially an older rookie. You know, fatigue comes into it. You fly to fly across the continent to Hawaii. Then you go to Palm Springs. You've got to learn three golf courses. You make the cut. Then you go straight to Torrey Pines. You, you have to learn two more courses there. Then you go to Pebble Beach. You learn three courses. So, you know, by the end of February, you're exhausted. The third event, I met Nick Faldo on the punting green at um, – Tory Pines. So, you know, that was cool to meet the person that had kind of, you know, been an inspiration to you. It, it, it was it was so interesting just to be around the best players in the world and watch them and, you know, just stand back and say, blimey, I'm a member of the, the greatest club in golf. To earn a card at the age of 40, that's a very American success story. You, you must be intensely proud of that. Yeah, I absolutely am. Um, you know, the, the tales of perseverance, you know, everyone has them, you know, especially in business, you know, for every successful businessman you see, you've seen someone who's gone through those struggles and has, you know, failed more than they succeed. And obviously golf, that's the ultimate case of that. Um, was I ever close to quitting? Probably Probably there was a couple of times where, you know, you would catch yourself thinking, oh, my friends are, you know, living in a house and got a nice car and go on vacation and, and do everything that they want to do. And I'm in a cheap hotel in South Dakota trying to make $500 for the week. So, you know, there were, there were times where it got tough, but, you know, I, I always had a, an in, intensely optimistic and enthusiastic appreciation of where I was, a realistic view of where I need, what I needed to do to get better. So I always had a path and a plan. And obviously there's, you know, forks in the road, but um, I never really got derailed too long and, and was very fortunate to have luck and, and meet people at the right time to help me and, and push me in the right direction. And, um, you know, for that, I'm intensely grateful. You ended up playing 41 events on the PGA Tour. You touched on a couple of the high points. What were some of your best memories playing on tour? 
Well, I mean, yeah, the, the nothing gets better than, you know, as a rookie, you know, anytime you qualify for the FedEx Cup playoffs, it's an incredible achievement. You're, you're you know, immediately you start as a, in effect, behind the eight ball. You don't get your choice of tournaments. You don't get to play a full schedule. Uh, you have to learn all these courses. You're playing against players who have played the same courses for, you know, maybe a decade or two. Um, and to qualify for the FedEx Cup playoffs was an amazing achievement. And, and I played at Bethpage uh, Black. I played the practice round. And I thought this is impossible. It's so long. I don't hit it very long. It was not overly firm. Um, and I thought, well, this is going to be a short wait. But you know what? I, I, I made it. I, I made the FedEx Cup playoffs. That's an achievement. Well, it was amazing. The PGA Tour agronomy staff are incredible. The course just absolutely flipped around overnight and it became firm. And all of a sudden, where I was hitting six irons and five irons, I was hitting eight irons. And all of a sudden, this was a kind of a course that I could actually play because I I have an appreciation of classic golf design. I like to work the ball both ways. Um, I like to control my spin, control my trajectory. Now, all of a sudden, it's not very one-dimensional. It's multi-dimensional. And I can hit short irons where, you know, I, I'm, I can be competitive. And so play great for the first two rounds. Play with Jason Day and um, really enjoy my time with Jason through knowing him from the Corn Ferry Tour. But, um, you know, comfortably beat him and uh, was sitting there. I was actually putting on the, the 36th hole and I don't look at scoreboards. And um, I was lining up a putt and, and I, you know, looked at the hole and then just looked up and I saw the leaderboard and I saw... Christian Woods right next to each other on the leaderboard. Hmm. Well, I now, I now know why I don't look at leaderboards because that <laughs> I, think I had about an eight footer for birdie and I didn't touch the hole. But I finished and I said to my caddy, "Do you think we might play with Tiger tomorrow?" And he said, "It's looking that way, isn't it?" And uh, got the text on the phone uh, not long after and found out I was. So, you know, that obviously was by far the highlight and. You know, the experience of playing with arguably the greatest player who's ever played the game was amazing. Um, he he was incredible to play with, to watch, but also, you know, to talk to. He, you know, it was very surprising. I thought it would be a handshake on the first, a handshake on the 18th and not much in between. But uh, it actually started really early where there was a pivotal moment. Uh, in the round in that we were walking off the first tee. I'd hit, you know, hit one right down the middle, which was good. And uh, I'm walking off the, the tee and me and my caddy are kind of taking some deep breaths and we hear someone running up behind me. It's Tiger coming to kind of talk. And I thought, blimey, this is weird. And he, he, he asked a question and I think if I'd have answered it different, it may have gone a little bit different. There may have been less chatter. He came up to me and said, Oh, hey, Gary, uh, you know, what part of Australia are you from? <laughs> and I said, Oh, Tiger, your people didn't do a very good job researching me last night, did they? Did they? I said, I'm from England. And he laughed. And, and then that kind of, that kind of let him know I was, you know, I was, I was a pretty good guy. It was going to be a, an int- a fun day, a relaxed day. And uh, we connected immediately and we probably talked for probably half the holes, just walking down the fairways. And um, I hit one shot that, uh, I hit a, a four iron hybrid out of a bunker that kind of skimmed off the top of the bunker, went straight up in the air, landing on the landed on the green, and it kind of spun, which is very hard to do on these rock hard greens. And he looked back at me and um, used some salty language in a complimentary way that I'll always remember. When Tiger Woods says, "Are you something kidding me?" <laughs> uh, then that will go down in my book as something pretty impressive. I'm glad you brought that up because this is a kind of a right turn. I wasn't planning on talking about Tiger, but since you brought it up, he has that intimidating persona for those outside of the game and and even for a lot of players inside the game, very intimidating. But I've heard stories like that from a lot of players that he's a player's player. He's a guy's guy. And if you can prove that you can hang with him, that you're not intimidated by him, I've heard many players say he's a wonderful playing partner, and it seems like that was the case for, with you. Absolutely, I, you know, I, I'm a I'm a big reader. I love that Ian Fleming, James Bond books. There was a, a chapter in Doctor No. I think it was something like a a velvet lined cell. I, I almost feel like Tiger is trapped in a velvet lined cell. Of you know, he he can't be the normal tiger that he actually is because there's so many people around him wanting a piece of him. You know, there's cameras stuck in his face, microphones stuck in his face at all times. He just wants to be a normal guy. 
and he's not able to do that. So when he's inside the ropes and it's just two of you or you and your caddy and he and his caddy, then all of a sudden he can be who he, who he really wants to be, which is just one of the lads, one of a, a normal guy who just is in t- insanely good at golf. But we had really normal conversations. And um, I, I remember we were walking up one fairway and um, I, I said, Ty, it's been an amazing experience. Um, you know, I, I, I can't thank you enough for being so uh, so nice to me and, and, and keep and helping me you know, kind of relax a bit. It's a big deal for me. And, and I said to him, but you know what? I don't think I would swap my life for yours or anything. And he kind of looked at me and, you know, without saying anything, you, you could tell he was looking at me thinking, boy, I wouldn't mind just being anonymous just for one day, just like that, that guy, like that Gary Christian, that would be, that would be a refreshing change just for a while. How did you make the transition from playing to broadcasting? I, I, I actually did something I got a call out the blue um, to do live. I think it was called live at the pre the precursor to uh, PGA Tour Live, and it was at um, I think it was at Torrey Pines. Um, I was in the booth. Uh, I think it was with Jim, Jim Gallagher Jr. And they just put me in there and and just tried it out. I guess they had found out that um, I, you know I was injured because I blew out my knee that next year, and you know did okay. Um, but try was trying to come back again, so um, I, I enjoy doing it so much. I thought, okay, this is, is something I'm I'm going to do. But obviously, I'm going to come back and get the knee uh, healed and everything, and it never healed. So you know, I had to make that decision. You know, I, you can't play against the best players in the world at seventy five percent, especially when you you know as good as I am, which was not great. So just out of the blue, I I, I reached out to uh, Jason Wesley at Sky Sports uh, in Britain, I explained the situation, and I just played on tour, and he you know knew me from obviously covering the 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 tour and my experience with Tiger, and he actually said, well, actually you're just what we're looking for. We we need a guy who's English or who's British that has actually played the Euro, the, the the PGA Tour and can be a, an analyst for us in uh, to, to to cover the PGA Tour. Um, you know, all our guys are former European tour players. So it was just a, just a very lucky conversation at the right time. He said, the only problem is you'll have to come to London and do it in studio. I said, just sign me up. I'd love to have the opportunity to come home, see my mum and dad and, you know, be able to start my career and, and get a, a media profile. So uh, it, it worked great. So I did that for two or three years, I think about 17 weeks a year, which was just amazing for me when I would you know, I was able to get home maybe once a year for a couple of weeks. I I got to spend a third of the year back at home with my mum and dad and brother and and family and friends, and it was just a, it was a wonderful time in my life to be to have that opportunity that I never thought I'd get to do uh, to spend that much time at home, and it, it worked out great because the shows were in the evening, so I spent all day you know, just traveling into London, walking around Richmond, you know, walk along the Thames. I saw so much of London that I grew up in that I didn't really experience before and then do the show and then get on the train on uh, Monday morning, go down to my mum and dad's um, and then come back Thursday morning back on the train. So uh, it, it was very fortunate. And then that led to, you know, PGA Tour Live offering me some work, the Golf Channel offering me some work and, and kind of building my resume from there. Who did you learn from? Who did you lean on as you developed as an announcer? Um, I, I, Craig Perks and I have always been very close. He was on the call when I got my PGA Tour card uh, um, at the Corn Ferry Tour event when I won in um, in Pittsburgh, and he was actually, you know, he and Jerry Falls were commentating at the time, and you know, they almost they they got a little emotional just describing what it was like for a 40, 40 year old to, to get his tour card. So he, he had made the transition obviously before me, but I, I would speak, I spoke to him actually when I first made one of my comebacks from injury and I said, man, I'm just not enjoying playing. I can't play, you know, what, what would you recommend? You've been through, you know, struggling towards the end of your career. And, you know, he kind of, you know, he kind of encouraged me that, you know, this is something that I could do. And, you know, if I need any help, give him a shout and, and, you know, he'll be happy to, to help in any way he could. He, he was very, very good indeed to, to just help me along. And, you know, just other people just along the way have just given little nuggets and, and help and, 
you know, you like to ask the people who you look, you watch and ask what they do and kind of take that on board. But I've learned that you want to be your own man. You don't want to copy someone, but you, you want to use what it is that they do well and then put your spin on it. That's your, that's comfortable where you're not faking it. You, you know, you're always going to be found out if you're faking it. What was the hardest thing to learn about golf broadcasting? I think um, I think in, interviewing for a player is very very difficult because you're used to being at the other end of the microphone where you can talk as long as you want. When you have a thirty second question that you've got to condense into seven seconds, um, it takes a while to get used to. So um, that that's something I've worked hard at. I'm still not perfect at it, but I've got better at it. But you know, you you would there's not really a it doesn't really seem to be a template to exactly how to do it you you would love for someone just to grab you and just spend hours with you just talking okay this was really good change this a little bit change that a little bit i i got someone that i do uh, talk to maureen Lindsay at the tour that um it has has helped me just to try and you know knock the rough edges off it but um that that was the hardest thing and uh, you know i've always been pretty good with how i commentate in the you know, I try not to put too much in there. It, it's just less is more. Let me add whatever context I can to help the viewer at home understand what the challenges are to the shot. If it's a hard shot, an easy shot, what good expectations would be, and then just let the picture tell the story. Overall picture in golf broadcasting, PGA Tour Live, which I've also worked on, created some new opportunities for announcers. Live Golf did the same thing, but those seats are limited. And we're seeing a significant move now towards remote production, which I've talked about with other guests on the podcast. So how do you make yourself stand out in the crowd? Yeah, that, I mean, that's the, um, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? You know, number one, obviously, you have a different accent, so that helps. You, you really need to know what it is that would help you stand out. You know, my style is different from a lot of other people, uh, yeah, but it's just, it's very competitive. Everyone has their advantage. Everyone has their niches. Everyone has their sort of demographics that really relate well to them. And it's just trying to find that sweet spot of, of maybe going a little bit out of your comfort zone to maybe bring in a different de- demographic that, uh, you know, maybe before you, you hadn't resonated with it as well as you, maybe you could have done. And so I think it's, I think it's just being nimble. I think you have to keep up with the times and keep up with who's watching. If you understand who's watching, it's not always easy to figure out who is watching um, because what some people like, you know, other people who have watched golf for years don't like. And so it's trying to thread the needle. Hopefully I can find what that secret source is right now. I'm trying to figure it out, to be honest. Yeah, and that leads me to something you and I talked about before we recorded this, the youth movement in recreational golf, something that you called bro golf, which I love, <laughs> golf golf as social media versus the term you used was proper golf. Yeah. And as I mentioned, you and I are the same age. We cannot pretend to be something that we're not. How does one stay true to who you are and still remain relevant in the game? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you know, both groups – have great validity you know the booming golf has just been incredible it has just exploded over the last three or four years um and so the younger dem- demographic the younger generation that's come in they're the reason why golf has exploded that's the reason why you can't get a tea time at the weekends that's the reason why you know club memberships have gone up just because demand and supply and there's such a huge demand for playing golf now now for me it's just taken time to appreciate that that's how golf has changed. And as a result, I've got to appreciate that, you know, it's not necessarily about what golf was 10 or 20 years ago, Um, that it was a little bit more genteel. It was, um, you know, there was a seriousness about score. There was um, a seriousness about playing to the rules of golf. You know, that has great validity, but now people play it, you know, they play it for fun. They play it to be outside. They play it to escape from from the the normal life. And so scores a lot of the time isn't that isn't as big of a deal as it used to be. You know, big deal if you're playing a a Seth Rayner design. You know, I just want to play a place that um, you know, is 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 nice and green, it has a nice 
turnhouse or it has a nice bar afterwards. You know, that's what I have to, I have to get my head around. And I'm starting to get that now. I, you know, I'm starting to appreciate it. You know, I, I'm still struggling with music too loud when, when you're playing in the middle of a round of golf, but that's all part of it. And, and that's not going to, that's not going to change anytime soon. However, you've also got to understand that, you know, golf is fickle and, you know, we may wake up tomorrow and golf isn't as cool to the new demographic that's playing. It still has the challenges that it's always had. It takes too long to play. It's expensive and it's really, really difficult to play. And all of a sudden, you know, some people may wake up the next morning and say, you know what, I'm spending a lot of money to do something that I'm not very good at. Maybe there's something else I might try. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's where you understand the people who have played traditional, maybe proper golf is not the correct terminology, but uh, it's as good as I can get. They're always going to play golf and they're always going to be there. So, um, you know, that's the eternal conundrum right now in how you balance the two and, and you allow both groups to coexist and enjoy you know the greatest sport there is on the day that we record this breaking news on a podcast terrell hatton reportedly to live golf for 63 million dollars to play on john rom's team there are also reports as we record this that the tour is close to working out an arrangement with the public investment fund in saudi arabia and by the time anyone listens to this the story will change again how do you see from your perspective, men's professional golf sorting itself out? You know, I think now all the adults are in the room and they know, they understand that there has to be an element of coexistence. Maybe John Rahm was the catalyst to, to, to finally get everyone on the same page. Um, we all want to see the best players in the world play together against each other. And I think, you know, now, you know, with Rahm, you know, with Hatton, there's just now the accelerant put on it. Okay, we've got to figure this out because, you know, you know, in the big scheme of things, it's the fans. It's the fans that keep the game going, you know, in the, in the way that we see it broadcasted. And, you know, if the fans switch off, because they, you know, they they're not seeing everyone play against each other all the time. You know, that's going to be a real problem. So I think everyone understands that now, which is the main thing. You know, I think before the the two camps were so far apart, and there were maybe axes to grind, and you know, it wasn't a healthy environment to negotiate and to come to an agreement. Now I think everything is a lot more in position where now we can get an agreement where it's going to work. And and I think it's going to come out, the game is going to come out stronger. I, I think the players are going to be happy with how it comes out. I certainly think the fans will be happy with how it comes out. And I think all the bodies involved are going to figure out that it's way better coexisting uh, than, than fighting each other and fighting each other in, in the courts. As you and I move into this next stage of our career, I started a podcast. You started hosting golf trips to the UK, and you've been looking for public speaking engagements, motivational speaking. What is it about your story that would compel someone to bring you in? Yeah, I think it's the everyman story. Like, like I said earlier on, you know, for every successful person, it's not been an upward trajectory from the time they left school. There are so many ups and downs, and there's usually way more downs than ups. Um, and, and a lot of people you know, never get to that opportunity where they, they have that upward trajectory because it's too tough, and, and it's, you have to persevere. You don't, have, you don't have the money. You don't have the enjoyment of what you're doing. You maybe lose self-belief. And so everything that people struggle with in, in, in normal day-to-day -day life, in trying to run their businesses and run their lives – I've experienced it completely in exactly the same way, but trying to make my way in the, in the game of professional golf. And so I think people can relate to my story. You know, I, you know, obviously <laughs> we would love to sit and listen to Tiger or we'd sit, love to sit and listen to Jordan Spieth or Scotty Scheffler or the, all the great players, Rory McIlroy. But from the, basically the moment they touched the club, it was a matter of when they were going to be a member of the PGA Tour, when are they going to win majors, when are they going to become Hall of Famers, all of those things. And so people love listening to that, love listening to what they've achieved. But, you know, it's, it's not overly relatable to so many people because 
of they are the absolute exception to the rule. And so I think people can kind of connect with my story a little bit more. And, and I kind of relate it to business and, and, and use very similar experiences of surrounding yourself with the right kind of people, having that self-belief, having that overarching vivid vision of what it is you're trying to do and trying to achieve and how you're going to achieve that um learning from feedback um, of from more from failures than successes and using those failures to be better the next time all of these things i've talked to so many successful business people they've experienced the same thing so there's a kind of a symmetry that um you know, people enjoy listening to and you know if you can and if you can then maybe do a little something on the course with you know maybe helping business people who are very very busy people who don't have time to practice you know how do you get the most out of the limited time you have to play golf and, and have that limited time to practice you know maybe get them thinking differently to to, to aid their enjoyment we you know, obviously played in so many pro-ams on the tour and the corn Ferry tour that you see so many people playing pro-ams and, you know they play once every three or four weeks and you know they're excited to be there but you know they just you know, they aren't, aren't ready to to play on a golf course with a with a pga tour player and you know they kind of get a little bit intimidated they kind of then get in their own head and they have a great day but they think what if man i wish i could have played a little bit better so you know trying to help people kind of learn the validity of a good short game and simple techniques and simple expectations and you know, learning about pace is more important than line and stroke on the putting greens and, you know, just simple things like fundamentals of alignment, grip, you know, learning what the club head wants to do and what the ball wants to do. Just simple things where you can waste a lot of time over obsessing about things when you don't have that time to put your mind to, to work on your game the way a, a PGA Tour professional does. If I were to sign up for a golf trip to the UK, organized by Gary Christian, what could I expect? Well, you could expect, uh, yeah, in effect, like a concierge service. What I like to do is to meet with the group beforehand to, to, to understand what it is, what do you want? Where do you want to play first, obviously? And then, okay, what, what experience do you want? Is it just all going to be golf? Is it going to be golf and visiting stuff? You know, what kind of food do we want to eat? You know, just trying to give them expectations of, you know, the weather and, you know, if you play this much golf, I play 36 holes on a Lynx golf course in 30 miles an hour, wind and rain, man, you may not want to get out of bed the next morning. So just trying to understand, you know, what physically would get the most out of the trip and, and maybe too much might, you know, lessen the, the enjoyment of the trip. But I think just the whole package where when you get there, there's no surprises. So then basically all you got to do is wake up on time and get on the bus. Um, you know, then when you're there, you know, you'll, you, you'll get a little bit more context of the golf course and understanding the golf course, you know, maybe meet some of the pros and the members and you know, get to find out a little bit more about where you're playing because members are so proud of their golf clubs that, um, you know, they will sit and have a couple of beers with you and tell you all the stories and, you know, the caddies are great, get those sorted out for you. And then, you know, you're playing with a, a guy who used to play on the tour and play with tiger and you know it's it's kind of a different experience to to maybe play with someone who can still play pretty well and show you how to navigate your way around a very difficult golf course and i think when you put all those together you know, people like an experience and it's um it, it's something that golfers traditionally enjoy just sitting around a table after they play golf and and say hey you'll never guess what i did last time i really enjoy this play with this guy who's does a bit of TV, played on tour, played with Tiger. God, we had a really fun time. It, it was uh, it was different to what we did last time we went on a golf trip. So that's kind of my goal, to just make a, a memorable golf trip, just that little bit more memorable. What is your blue sky vision then? What's an ideal schedule, an ideal combination of working in broadcasting, hosting trips, doing some speaking engagements, maybe doing some teaching? If you could design the perfect schedule for yourself, what would that be? But I, I think yeah, 15 to 20 weeks commentating um, is absolutely ideal. I mean, the travel is hard. I mean, the hours are long. You know, the research is, is difficult. It's, you know, you've really got to throw yourself into it. You've got to be fully focused. And at the end of a week's trip, boy, you'll feel pretty drained. I did back-to-back -back weeks um, at the Farmers and the Amex. And, boy, that, uh, that red eye knocked it out of me. And then yesterday, I, I, I really didn't have much left in the tank. 
if you have the passion for the game, then you have to, you, you've got to throw everything in. And if you don't throw everything into it, then you haven't done your job. Um, so, the, you know, a mix of that, you know, I'd love to do five, six trips a year back to Britain. Um, and, and, you know, the speaking, if you could do 10 or 20 of those a year, it, it would just be perfect. Um, you know, I, I, I love being able to, I, I do a really good job of being able to switch off. And when I'm at home, I'm at home. And, I, you know, I love being around my family and we love spending time together. We love traveling together. Um, and then, you know, the teaching, you could just fit in when you're at home. So, uh, you know, there's lots of there's lots of different ways of doing it. But, um, you know, as a player, you're kind of used to working 25 weeks a year. You know, in total, you would say that's about what you would what your body could handle with travel and and everything that comes with it. But I also love soccer as well. Soccer is, you know, my other great passion. I was really fortunate. I got to interview Rob McElhenney last year, sorry, last week at the Farmers. I'm a huge, huge football fan. And, you know, his show, Welcome to Wrexham, he he and Ryan Reynolds bought this non-league Welsh football team, and we we experienced the journey over two years of, of the show being Welcome to Wrexham on FX. And you, I, I think it's done the best job of explaining to the American audience who watch it why soccer is, is what it is in, in Britain, why soccer is a fabric of society, why these towns just embrace their local football team. And it's everything for them. It is absolutely everything. And so to see the journey from them going from non-league into the English Football League – and hopefully get promoted again to League One next year. They're in second place right now. You, you know, I think the journey has been amazing watching that. I would love to be a part of something like that, a part of, ex, uh, of being able to explain why soccer is what it is, why the whole world embraces the sport of soccer. I think the interview I had with Rob, you could check it out on X and on um, PGA Tour Live, put it up there as well. You get to see from his perspective as an owner, what it means to him. And, you know, we, you know, I asked him, you know, he's a big Philadelphia Eagles fan and, you know, two very different types of franchises, uh, a massive multinational known the world around and this tiny little Welsh club, football club. He said, it's the same, you know, it's working class people um, that get behind their, the, the football team, they get behind their city, they're proud of their town and it's what it means to them. And he, he's, he said it and he explained it in such a manner. I think if you watch that interview, you will have a greater appreciation of what the game of soccer means around the world. I like to wrap up the podcast with the same question for all the guests. If you were asked for advice by someone who was considering a career in sports media, what would you tell them? I would say surround yourself with smart people who have done what it is that you want to do. I, I enjoy mentoring people and, and talking to them when, when they start to get, offer them advice. But it's, you know, like in, in, in any thing that you do in life, you want to talk to the people who are in the spot where you want to be. And so I would say do everything you can. And it doesn't even have to be in your sport. Just Go talk to people, ask if you can shadow them, ask if you can talk to the people around them to find out what makes them successful and what it is that they do and how they prepare and you know how they take on feedback. All of those things will help immensely. And then from then on, it's just – Man, it is. You've got to hustle, and you know I'm learning that right now. I have to hustle. I have to start calling people out the blue, and I have to start explaining what I've achieved, and I've got to explain why it is that I could be an asset. And I think all of those things, you know, people appreciate you know the effort because, like we said, everyone's been on that path before. When you started your career, you had to hustle and you had to call and you had to take no for an answer way more than you took yes for an answer. And, and, and that is hard to do, but uh, ultimately it will lead to you to do what it is you want to do or give you certainly the best chance of that. In just a few seconds, we'll have some closing thoughts on this episode, so stay tuned. If you're enjoying it so far, please consider subscribing or sharing and leave a review let me know what you'd like to hear in the future on Media Credentials.
Gary described how there's no template for how to progress as an announcer. As he says, it would be a massive help to be told exactly what the expectations are and be given a chance to remedy a weakness or a blind spot. As a player, Gary could look at his stats and know exactly what he had to work on. As an announcer, he, we, don't have that luxury. Gary and I are about the same age, and we're both looking at pivoting careers. He talked about trying to find the secret sauce. He used words like sweet spot and being nimble. I think it boils down to another word he used, hustle. Thanks again for listening to Media Credentials. For examples of my work, including video and audio clips, a blog, and my contact page, check out witwatson.com. Thank you.